Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, also a technical consultant for Altium. And today we are going to be looking at how to use one of the new extensions in Altium Designer called EMI Stream. Now, if you saw one of our earlier podcasts with Yoshi Fukawa, then you're probably already aware of the EMI Stream extension. So we'll go ahead and link to that podcast in the description. Now, this extension is really cool because it allows you to run design rule checks that specifically look for potential problems in your PCB layout that can cause EMI. So we're gonna play around with this extension. We managed to get some access and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use one of the example projects that comes with Altium Designer. You can get your free trial of Altium Designer and follow along if you want. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I am inside Altium Designer and I have one of the example projects pulled up here so that we can see how to use this new extension. Now, for all of the extensions that are inside Altium Designer, the way you can access them is you go up here to your little user icon in the top right corner, click extensions and updates, and you will see the entire list of installed and available extensions for your copy of Altium Designer. So there's a ton of different extensions. I wish we could go through all of them. They're used for so many different things and we don't really have time, of course, in this video, but the ones that we wanna highlight right now are the EMI Stream extension. So you can see there are two versions or two utilities in this extension. We have the EMI Design Rule Checker and then the Plain Resonance Analyzer. Now, I've already got this installed, and once it's installed, you can access this particular extension from the Tools menu. You can see right here, there's an option for EMI Design Rule Check and Plain Resonance Analysis, and that is how you're gonna access those tools. So first, before we start playing around with some EMI Design Rule Checks, let's take a look at this board. This board uses a Xilinx Spartan FPGA. So it's not a huge FPGA, but you can see if I zoom in here, it's got a moderate pin count. It's a QFN, so it's not gonna have huge pin count like you would find on the BGA, but still pretty decent. So this particular component has a lot of IOs going around it, and those IOs are being routed on a surface layer with some ground pour. And you can see the ground pour is assigned here up in the top left corner of the screen. Now on the back layer, we also have a lot of ground pour. You can see it right here. And we have uh, some other traces going over to some headers. It looks like we've got a power regulation section. We've got a power input. And if I look in 3D, you can really see everything that's going on here. And of course, you can see here we have a big screen that's not visible in the 2D layout, but in 3D, you can see it quite easily. So what we wanna do is we wanna look at this board and see if this layout is gonna experience any severe EMI problems. Now, if you have been watching any of the videos for any appreciable period of time, you will know that this board could have some problems for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main reason is that we don't have ground planes on the next layer. We actually have a ground coupling on the surface layer, and that's what we're relying on to provide a nice clean return path. Is this good? Is this bad? Well, as I like to say, it depends. In this case, uh, I would say that this is a less desirable layout than we would like, and there are a couple of reasons for that. So first, you can see here along this routing channel, in this channel, I have a lot of routes going in parallel. Here in this channel, you can see that there's only ground pour along the edge of two of these routes. So here we have this route uh, coupled very tightly to this portion of the ground. And then we have this other route, the test route, connected very tightly to this portion of ground. So the rest of these are all essentially relying on ground on the very next layer to provide a consistent return path. Now, if we look at the PCB stack up, we go into the layer stack manager, we can see here that we really only have a two layer board. So it's not like we have any of our other layers hidden. It is just a two layer board. And it's essentially just a signal power ground, signal power ground type of board. For this particular board, if we wanna ensure that this thing can operate at high speed with this LCD screen, and that it's gonna have nice tight return paths that are gonna ensure that we have low EMI everywhere, we would then want to run some simulations to verify that. And of course, with this type of board, your goal would be to ensure that the stack up and the layout and routing are all going to be low enough noise that this thing could pass EMC testing and eventually be made into a real 
product. So instead of using something like a 3D field solver, which you can access through some of the extensions in Altium Designer if you have access to like ANSYS, instead of doing that, we're gonna use a bit of a simpler simulation tool that makes it really easy to do these specific types of checks. So what makes EMI stream different from something like you might find in ANSYS when you're trying to evaluate a PCB is it takes a rules-based approach. So it's essentially qualifying the PCB against well-known best practices that you might have missed if you were doing the layout. And this is really common. If you miss one of these best practices for ensuring low EMI, it happens. Sometimes a board gets really complex. You just don't notice it as you're working. And the regular design rule engine that is used in Altium Designer or frankly in other PCB layout tools, they just won't catch it. So that's why you need something that's EMI design rule specific. 3D field solvers like, again, like ANSYS or even COMSOL or some of those other programs, um, those can be really difficult to use. And that's because they're trying to solve a general electromagnetics problem that gives you the electromagnetic field everywhere. And frankly, for this type of problem that you're trying to evaluate, when you just need to figure out whether or not you're obeying best practices for low EMI, you don't need to do that type of big simulation. Again, those simulation programs can be very difficult. Sometimes the only chance you really get to learn how to use them is either on the job or if you're doing like a PhD in physics type of program in university. So again, they can be very difficult to learn how to use and configure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this into the EMI stream program and we're gonna see what it tells us about the potential EMI problems in this board. So we're gonna use EMI stream for this and uh, the EMI design rule check is actually very fast. It doesn't take a lot of time for this simulation to run and to give you some really useful results. So you can see here, I just opened it up. It went really quick, works great. And we've already got this thing open in an external utility and we can run the EMI rule check. So to run the EMI rule check, I just go over here, EMI design rule check menu, click the button. It's gonna do some quick calculations and it's gonna give us a list of possible problems that could create an EMI violation and even an EMC failure. So we've got a lot of different error marks here on the left side of the panel. You can view them on a net by net basis here in this window, or if you go over here, you can look at the specific errors in different categories. Here we can already see that there's quite a few different errors related to return path. So this is something that is great to identify with a simulator. It's one of those things where it's actually really easy to identify on a two layer board. Now, if we look here at the no return path error, and I just kind of highlight this, you can already see where this particular error is gonna come about. So this particular error is gonna come about here in, let me just pan around here. So this particular error is gonna come about here where we actually have these traces running over this gap in the ground plane. And then we have all of these different traces that are routing over this gap as well as this other trace. So this isn't really a crosstalk problem because there's actually very small coupling right here. You can see that the length of these routes where my mouse is are very short. So there's not huge coupling over to this other trace on this adjacent layer. However, there is a big return path discontinuity here routing across this plane. Same thing here for this trace. So if we just go back to the PCB layout, here on this trace going across here, we have this thing also traversing a gap in the nearby ground on the next layer. And you can see here, this is not a high-speed signal, but this is the type of thing that would trigger a design rule error in terms of EMI if this were carrying a high-speed signal. So again, this just underscores, this is looking at best practices for ensuring that what you do in the PCB layout is actually going to obey the well-known best practices for ensuring low EMI. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna look at here is the return path error option. So here, if I just kind of pan over here, let's move this result out of the way and zoom in, you can see where it's flagging a no return path error. And it's really for all of these different traces that are branching off uh, near this RA2 and RA3 reference designator in the window. So those components, RA2 and RA3, they're right here. Um, these are just resistor arrays, but again, you can actually clearly see just by looking at this that if you have these traces being routed like this, that some of these are gonna have a very weak return path or no return path at all. Why is this problematic for EMI? 
Now, if these are just carrying DC, these traces are not going to generate really any EMI at all. So if they're just carrying DC, there's no switching, meaning that there's no uh, switching magnetic field and there's no switching electric field, and so they're not going to radiate. However, because there is no clear return path, what that means is that those traces have very large loop inductance. And when they have large loop inductance, they can receive noise from some external source. So remember, EMI goes both ways. It's not just the noise that the device emits, it's also the noise that the device receives. So because of that, we would wanna make sure that we provide a clear return path because that is going to handle the noise emission problem as much as it's going to handle the noise reception problem. In this particular board, one of the easiest things that we can do to improve the EMI situation is to close this out. We can then modify the PCB stack up. And I've, I've said many times before in webinars and uh, in other videos that we've done and in articles that usually, not all the time, but usually a lot of really simple EMI problems can be traced back to something in the PCB stack up and a real simple uh, solution is just to modify the PCB stack up. So what I've done is I've opened up, I'm gonna change the units first, but what I've done is I've opened up the PCB stack up right here, and uh, we're gonna add in some layers here, and we're gonna then go ahead and take this back into the PCB layout, and we're gonna fill all this in with ground and see if the situation changes. Here, what we would normally do is we would typically have something like uh, maybe you know 40 and eight and eight, and that gets us back to a total thickness of 62 mils. This is an okay stack up. It's pretty close to what you would find at most fabricators in terms of a standard stack up. And that's what we're gonna go with here. So I'm gonna save this. And we're gonna go back into the PCB layout. So now inside the PCB layout, what we can do is we can go ahead and fill all this stuff in with ground. And then we can go ahead and rerun the simulation. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Okay, so you can see now I've got ground poured on L1 and L2, and the idea here is that this is going to really help change the grounding situation in this board. Now you can see here where ground comes in and connects to these polygons on layer 2 and layer 3, and that's going to provide a nice clean return path everywhere. Now, typically what someone might do when they're in this situation is they're going to say, well, hey, shouldn't we fill all this in with stitching vias? In a case like this, I don't know that we really need it because we have nice, clean, uniform ground everywhere, um, but we're gonna just check on that with the EMI rule checker first. So let's go ahead and take a look at the EMI situation with the EMI stream and see if things have improved in terms of the return path. Just from looking here on the right-hand side, um, you can already see that we have many, many of those errors cleared up. So previously, this list went on for a little bit and filled up this entire window. Here, we've solved quite a few of those problems uh, just by adding in some ground. So that should illustrate what I was saying. A lot of the really simple errors with EMI and noise can be solved by just adding in ground. These errors fall into a few different categories, but what you can actually do here is just go through each of these uh, entries in this list, and then you can look at what needs to happen in order to solve each of those problems. So I'm gonna look at this reference change just as an example. So if I go over here to this reference change, double click on it, I can see exactly which via is making a change between reference layers without providing a clear return path along that route. So it's right here next to C44. So that is going to be on the lower right portion of the FPGA. So if we go back over here, we can see that it is actually right here. So it is this five volt portion right here. This is where you need to ask yourself, is this carrying a switching signal that we need to worry about? Or is this just a DC signal that we don't need to worry about? Well, I would say in this case, because we're working with a high speed component that's gonna be pulling power from all of these rails at high speeds, it would be best to ensure that we take care of a lot of these problems here with reference changes. And so the easiest way to do that is to simply put a ground via running along this that connects the two planes right next to this five volt via. So we could just literally grab this ground via right here. We can copy it and paste it over here. We'll just make sure that it doesn't interfere with anything on the back layer. So you can see here, this is a pretty tight layout. So it's not always so easy to put that in there, but it's literally just copying and moving that ground via over. And you can just put it right there 
and that will address that problem. Now, typically what happens when you have a multi-layer board and you're doing a lot of those different routes is you may need to put stitching vias in. Stitching vias are one way to handle the issue when you have a lot of layer changes going on at once, and when you're making those reference layer changes during that transition between the two layers, you don't have a clear return path. Stitching vias are one way to ensure that there is going to be a return path at, in as many locations as possible. So that is one thing to help. So I'm not gonna go through every single error in this list in this video, but if you get your own copy of EMI Stream, what you can do is you can then run this same process. You can go through each of these errors in this list just by double clicking. It will go over here and it will tell you what you need to change in this window on the left-hand side. It even tells you some solutions here and it's pretty cool because it really helps you speed up that process of fixing a board so that you can ensure you have low EMI. All right, folks, thanks for watching this and thanks for checking out EMI Stream. We're gonna keep going through and doing some of these videos with extensions because there's a lot of great extensions in Altheme Designer and I think some of them are a little underutilized given how they can help you speed up your design process. All right, folks, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section. Definitely hit that subscribe button. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.